I'm going to invite you to turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 4 again. Mark chapter 4, we're, we're almost out of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. You have your Bibles with me this morning. We have been looking at a several parables of Jesus. And two to, to finish out the Mark passage here. One of which is in Mark exclusively, and the other which is found in both Matthew and Luke. So, to this point uh, in Jesus' ministry, um, it's been public and it's been plain. And we're going to look at that, and now he's going to turn his attention to his disciples. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray that you would teach us this morning. May we be encouraged through your word, Lord, it is a work of the Spirit that it, we are entrusted with your precious word. And so I pray your Spirit would minister it to us with understanding, with clarity, and to um, equip us for the week ahead. And I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So Mark chapter 4 and we have gotten to verse 21. Let me read through these verses here. Uh, and he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be, to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. But the measure you use it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The kingdom of God is as if a man should sh scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts it in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of a mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. And yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them. As they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately, to his own disciples, he explained everything. So as I said, Jesus, to this point, has been teaching publicly. And now he gathers his disciples, and we're looking at his 12, as well as probably several hundred others that had followed him to this point, been close with him, and, and embraced his ministry. And so he, he once, as he, he preached to the crowds, they followed him, and the religious leaders developed a greater and greater disdain for him. So, so at this point now, thousands have sort of backed away. And the religious leaders at this point have become more and more aggravated and annoyed and to the point of actual hate for Jesus. I would probably put the word hate became uh, their greater consuming passion at this point. The people have heard, but, were, but when considering the cost of discipleship, regarded it as too hard. I mean, that's why they all left. And the religious leaders, with their predisposed self-righteousness and works-oriented path to a holy God, were angry that anyone would challenge their authority to show people the way to God. So an increased hostility is now upon Jesus. And his band of 12 and those others that followed him were beginning to question what exactly, why is this kingdom not growing? Why does it not look like you know, these thousands of people that followed you, why are they not still following you? Why is there so much hatred on the part of the religious leaders? Well, for one reason, because they were self-righteous and they had no interest in, in, in following the authority or, or bowing the knee to the, the holy God. They just wanted to show the people that they were in charge. They had no interest in, in following God's way. They wanted to follow their own way. And given that no message can compare with the magnificent nature of this gospel, the good news of salvation, 
This refusal on the part of many was shocking and, and tragic. See, the gospel is the greatest news anyone could hear. We know that from those whose lives have been changed. From, from having been in that position of being dead in our trespasses and sins and now being alive to God, having the Spirit of God dwell in us, we know that that is the greatest news that one could ever hear. That God gave His Son to die as a sin offering so unworthy rebels might be reconciled to Him through Christ. And this was the problem, though, with Christ when Christ came preaching a kingdom of the heart, a kingdom of, of change within, a, a kingdom that was apart from works. You know, the religious leaders had their 630 additional commentary on the law, additional laws to the law of Moses to kind of keep the people in line and, and, and in, in a works kind of way, if I'm good enough, religious enough, righteous enough, if I, if I make sure every dot and tittle of the law is crossed and, and I make provision for anything else that I might not see in the, in the law given to us, well, they thought that was their way to find God. They had neglected the heart. They had been, as Jesus called them, whitewashed tombstones because they were dead. The heart was not receptive to God. Christ came preaching the kingdom. He came preaching a kingdom of change, not militarily, not mightily, but mightily within the heart. Total transformation of the inner man. Paul implores us to understand this in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. You remember this, right? For by grace you have been saved, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. But that was too much for those who refused to follow Jesus. And yet that's the beauty and the magnificence of the gospel. Through no merit of our own, we are elevated to a position of high privilege. Jesus came to rescue slaves of darkness and, and bring them into a kingdom of light. That was his purpose. He confers upon us the privilege of, of citizenship, citizenship of heaven, and adopt us as sins. You see, this is the, the right way to gain citizenship. You bow to the master. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're saved and you're adopted and you're brought into this heavenly citizenship. And so Jesus gathers those who have stayed with him and, and who are processing all that he's revealed to them about the kingdom. Very intimate relationship now. And he, has, he, he says to them, you need to be prepared to hear. He, he's preparing them all along this, this journey to, with understanding about the teaching of the kingdom. And they're getting it. They're, they're beginning to understand. They have a long way to go, but, but they're getting it. And he uses the word to that for them for, for hearing. In fact, in this passage of Mark, he uses the word for hear or hearing ten times. It must be important then to listen, right? It must be important not just to hear sounds or to come with a predisposition of what you want to hear, but it's pretty important at this point that you hear with understanding, that you grasp this kingdom message. And so it's no doubt that many of his followers were confused as to the nature of the advancement of this gospel kingdom. And so Jesus tells them to hear with understanding. Because at this point, a lot of people are, are leaving, as I said. The great crowds are beginning to get, you know, a little bit annoyed, and, and certainly religious leaders. And his disciples are saying, why don't they all follow? Why aren't they all still coming? And so Jesus is going to explain that to them. The previous parable that we looked at, the sower, the soils, I should say, really, the parable was given the emphasis of the fruit bearing, of the good soil. And, and fruit bearing is a result of hearts that have been properly prepared. So when the seed of the word is sown on the prepared heart, it germinates and produces good fruit. Now the point of the parable we're going to look at here in verse 26, and we'll get to that shortly, is that you don't do the regenerate. You are responsible 
to the word, to getting the word out, but you don't do the regenerating. Because God has prepared the heart of the right soil and they prepare and they bear fruit. That's a result of hearts being properly prepared so that that seed which is sown will produce good fruit. So the same emphasis is given regarding a profound and, and public display of kingdom citizenship. In Colossians 3, 2, we see that. Others will benefit from that life, and that is a faithful life that shines in Christ. So I want to look at, at this passage, verses 21, as we kind of gone back to the soils. Remember that this is the, the soil that he wanted us to understand is the soil of the prepared heart, the right heart. The heart that has received the word and responded to it. And he did the preparing. God did the preparing. And so in this passage, is a lamp brought to be under the basket or under the bed and not on the sand? This passage, he's talking about sowing the message of the kingdom. Or the kingdom of God is sown into prepared hearts. True disciples are, are ones with prepared hearts. They're eager to live and, and share the message of truth because the Holy Spirit has generated in them the discipleship mentality. That they've embraced Jesus' love and they desire to hear and obey his word. That's what a true disciple is. It is one who has been changed, whose, whose soil of their heart has been cultivated and has been, has been regenerated by God himself through Jesus Christ. And then he's eager. Because the regenerating work is done by God himself, that disciple is eager to live, share the message of truth. Because the Holy Spirit has, has generated that in him. He desires to obey and hear his word. Hear and obey, I should say. I mean, divine truth has found a place in his heart. And if divine truth has not found a place in your heart, then I, I really need to ask, have you been born again? Have you responded to the, the message of salvation? The parable of the soils emphasizes the importance of being a faithful hearer by distinguishing the good soil from the bad. And that's what he's saying to his disciples right now. You see, there's a distinction. There are many people who proclaim to follow me, but their hearts have never been prepared. As soon as it got tough or difficult or, or there was persecution or, or some other issue, they left because their hearts weren't on good soil. The seed wasn't sown on good soil of the right prepared heart. And so here he says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket? What he's going to say here is that you have a responsibility to proclaim the message of the kingdom. And the reason you have that is because you are lights of the world. The word I have brought in is that which illuminates the sin of the heart. And it, that message has not been given to you to bury under a rug or under a basket, as he says. John 8, 31 to 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews, who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so if that's the case, you're going to want to proclaim this. Colossians 1.10 so, says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. It is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket? No. Or under a bed and not on a stand? Obviously not. Don't be ridiculous. So if you are one of Christ's, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Bear fruit in every good work. Increase in the knowledge of God. You were meant to be that light that shines, that city that is set on a hill, as Matthew says. So faithful hearers are faithful and passionate proclaimers, and that's what he's getting at here. Nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone is ears to hear, let them hear. That's that, that phrase again we've seen over and over in Mark 4. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to one who has more will be given, and from one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That's a strange thing to say. 
Well, look at that. In this passage, our Lord is emphasizing fruit that is born out of real relationship with him. It's not something hidden. It's not something I'm ashamed of. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said. It is the power, the dunamis, the dynamite of God unto salvation. That's the Greek word he uses there in Romans chapter 1. It has the power to move mountains. In this case, a sinful and broken and dead heart. It's not made to be concealed. They are called to bear fruit to be obediently proclaiming it. So that the ridiculousness of this, this metaphor really is, did you buy this lamp that's supposed to give you light to put under a basket, a bed, and not on a stand? No, of course not. You bought it to bear fruit. You received the word of the kingdom in Christ and it was made and, and it was, you were prepared and given that word so that you could let it shine to those who would see it. Colossians 1, 3 to 6 says this, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So Paul is saying here to the Colossians, we have heard about your faithfulness. We have heard about the hope that you have in Christ and how you have laid it up and you have followed it. Now, I know there's some, some questions right now. There's some people trying to get into your church who are trying to, to dissuade you from that hope. But I want to thank God for that hope that you, that you cling to. And he goes on, he says, the gospel, that's the hope, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. So he's saying to them, what is this fruit doing? The fruit of righteousness, the fruit that bears out in your heart and life as a believer, well, it's increasing. It's, it's being seen throughout the whole world. It's bearing fruit. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Paphras, our beloved fellow servant, Paul's encouragement to the Colossians is then that you are just, you know, you are encouraging my heart because you claim to know Christ. You have confessed Christ as your Savior. You have repented of your sin. And guess what? I see that evidence. I am commending you because I see that evidence in your life. And those around you see that evidence. So this lamp, is not designed to be hidden. The truth that you have embraced, the heart that has been prepared and transformed is not meant to be hidden. It would be ridiculous to do that. Lamps at this time consisted of small pitchers or a saucer with a handle at the end. And the pitcher would be filled with oil and a, and a floating wick would be placed on the oil. And, and what that would do at this time is it would maximize its radiance. You get the picture, right? The picture to them is that, well, if I want to see anything, I need to put these lamps, these oil lamps, up high so that I can see my surroundings to maximize its radiance. They protruded from the wall, they were put on lampstands, lamp stand, and that glow would radiate throughout the room uninstructed. That's the point. And we can make that comparison to our modern day lighting. Nobody likes to sit in the dark. If you do, then there's something wrong with you. But most people want to be well illuminated, right? I don't like it when there's shadows and, and there's partial light or there's things I can't see. Because light was meant to shine on your surroundings. The light of the Word of God that has been given to you, well, you actually are the light. The Word of God transforming your heart, being born again, you are then to be that lamp that illuminates. So the point here is saying is those who receive the light of the gospel should illuminate or shine so others can see it. Now, if you go throughout scripture, light is used rep repeatedly. 
to picture spiritual truth. We could Psalm 36 and Psalm 119, Proverbs 6, Acts 26, we can go down the line here. It also is used to project holiness. And it is also a metaphor for spiritual life. So if those things are true, if God uses in his word, if he is using metaphors of the metaphor of light to describe for us holiness, spiritual truth, spiritual life, the way we should be acting, then it stands to reason, does it not, that we are the light that should shine that truth. I don't think he meant to get a lamp and put a lamp up here and that lamp's going to shine truth. No, he's saying you are the lamp. And you are to be put up on a pedestal in the sense of proclaiming that message. See, the, the Lord's words were a mandate for his disciples to proclaim the word as part of their mission to the world. And even though they may have questioned that they were still part of Jesus' mission, this is his command. So they're questioning. They're, 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 they're having some doubts at this point. They're, they're saying, well, if, and as he gives this parable, if you do, if God does the preparing, if God does the increase, well, are we part of this mission? And Jesus is saying, yes, you, you are part of this mission. And Jesus says, even though I'm speaking to you in parables, they're meant to be an act of divine judgment against obstinate unbelief of both people and religious leaders, and we talked about that. You are still to illuminate the gospel message to all. So even though I've switched, and now I'm talking to you in parables, which are meant for the believer, for my, follow, my intimate followers to understand, and I'm hiding sort of that truth, or I'm... I'm they understand the words, but because of their spiritual deadness, they don't get the message. Because they're obstinate in their unbelief. Their hearts are far from him. He says, but you still, even though that's true, you as a disciple of Jesus Christ still have to proclaim the message. You still have the mandate to be the light of the world. Even though others might not hear. In fact, he's going to instruct them before his ascension, and you should all remember this too in Matthew 28, 18 and 20. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Right? Before I leave, I want you to understand this. And by the way, this isn't just an ancient book. This is you and me as believers. You will receive power. So, if I'm going to ask you to be a light, to shine in this darkness, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that with intimidation and with fear, without fear? Well, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be, you shall be witnesses. And, and what happened in Acts chapter 2? Okay, you're talking about 12 disciples who were, they split when Jesus was being arrested. They denied him. They lived in some fear. They were, they were despondent. And he says, then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, Acts chapter 1. And here's the evidence of the power of the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 2, they preached to thousands and thousands. Peter and John are preaching, fishermen are preaching to thousands of people and they're giving the gospel to them and they're calling them to repentance and the church is born. So the Lord did not intend for the gospel to be permanently obscured. There, there was a time when the truth would be hidden and obscure from some obstinate rejectors and, and we see this in, in here and that's what he says, for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest nor is anything secret except to come to light. So there's going to be a time when truth will be hidden and obscured from these rejectors, but there's also coming a time when the hidden things are to be revealed and the secret things disclosed to the world. The, the era of unraveling the mysteries would commence with preaching the ministry of the apostles. And it would start when Jesus was with them. 
and would continue to the Great Commission and into Acts. This gospel of the kingdom, says Matthew, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Do you understand that part of your mission is to proclaim, to be that light, to take the gospel of new birth, of regeneration, of, of peace in Christ, of confession of sin. It's to take that message of the gospel to the whole world, and then the end will come. So every corner of the world has to hear that gospel. So in case some of you are thinking that tomorrow is a rapture, or maybe 2024, as I heard recently, was the rapture, the whole gospel hasn't gone out to the earth yet. The seed of saving faith in their hearts was to be faithfully proclaimed and produced. This is the fruit of their witness, of our witness. I mean, this mandate continues for us as disciples of Jesus Christ. And we must consider the implications of being diligent and therefore fruitful hearers. This is the whole point of he who has ears to hear, basically. You know, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Hear the message, not just the words. Let the message penetrate your heart and do something with it. What is the implication of hearing and believing and trusting? The implication is, is that we are lights. We minister that in both our works and our speech. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? You are the preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has used that. I don't understand in God's sovereignty, all of that. I don't understand why he uses the preaching of the gospel to penetrate the hearts of men. But he uses, he uses fallible people like us to do that. Well, faithful hearers work with expectation. And so in verses 24, 25, he say, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For the one who has more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Taken away. So pay close attention to what you hear. Be dedicated to the task of hearing because of the promise of eternal reward for faithfulness. And that's what he's saying here. Do the work. Do it diligently. Do it with a full heart because there is a reward at the end. Now, you, should, you obviously do it because of your love for Jesus, your love for God. But there is a reward for that faithfulness too. At harvest time, the, the faithful and diligent farmer could expect a, a flourishing crop. His efforts as a, as a sower would be rewarded by the size of his harvest. For the one who has more will be given, and for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and people who thought themselves to be religious, even that's going to go away. You have nothing there to hang on to if you're going to hang on to yourself. But if you're going to pursue Christ, that's where the reward comes in. Jesus' point was that those who faithfully proclaim, who do not take the light and hide it, would be rewarded eternally by God for their diligent efforts. Eternal rewards are privileges that last forever. Now, some people say, well, I don't do this for rewards. This is, well, okay, you do it because you love God. But the diligence of your work, God says, rewards await you. Paul even says, I look forward to that prize. I run the race. I'm looking for that prize. Now, certainly when you get those rewards, you're going to realize it's all the work of God anyway. But the point is, is that you are working hard for the kingdom. Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27, Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you might obtain it. That's how you need to be running the race of the Christian life. Run that you might obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we and imperishable, what is your reward? It's eternal life. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box 
as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 to 20, it says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? He was saying to the Thessalonians here that, you know, he was saying in the beginning, he was trying to, I, I want to see you, I want to, you know, I want to speak with you. And the point was, is that, what is the crown of my boasting? What do I, what do, what is, what am I, what do I want to boast in in my ministry? He says, it's you. It's the fact that the gospel, that I brought the gospel to you and you believed. For you are glory and are our glory and our joy. That's what Paul's trying to get across here. The parable of the parallel in Matthew 13 adds the phrase, and he will have abundance as believers dispense truth to others. God blesses them with more power, joy, satisfaction, and reward. That's the blessing of letting your light shine. You get joy. You get more satisfaction in Christ. Well, false disciples then, by contrast, are characterized by fruitlessness. And this is what, again, he's saying from one who has not even what he has will be taken away. And John 15 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And that's the work of sanctification in your life, the pruning. That it may do what? That it's going to bear more fruit. So when life is tough, when it's hard, when that pressure cooker of life just kind of like, you know, i got to get out of here. It's just, it, it, it's too much. It's to do what? It's so that you might bear more fruit. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. And that's a picture of hell. Secondly, in this outline, we see the kingdom begins insignificantly, but it grows mightily. And this is where we're going to, just kind of run through these two parables um, because it sort of gets a little redundant, but it's, but it's important that they understand. So he talks about the kingdom coming and being established at the beginning here. The soils, the, the overarching message of that is that what soil is your heart being prepared in? You know, are you saying that you believe Christ, but you really haven't had a regenerated heart? And so when the weeds come and choke it out or when the difficulties of life gets too hard, you leave. But the good soil, the point of that whole parable was the good soil, the one with the right prepared heart, one that responds to God. That's, that's the one that comes into the kingdom. And now he says about the growth of the kingdom, talks about the growth of the kingdom. And he's going to tell his disciples here that don't expect the kingdom to grow like conquest. Like a military army comes in and they obliterate their enemy and, and they they you know they they embrace all their spoils there that's not how this kingdom comes about because I, I know that's what you're looking for you're looking for somebody to come in and conquer the romans and set up the millennial kingdom or set up a kingdom the kingdom of david again and jesus says no the kingdom of god is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground he sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, and then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The kingdom will grow slowly. But you need to be a faithful worker. So if you're in this kingdom, you are a faithful worker. You are the one that plants the seed. But you don't bring the harvest in. We can't produce life. It's God that brings the results. In John 3, 3 8 says that. And we don't have time to get into this, but Nicodemus, if you go through the, that whole conversation with Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you cannot produce life in yourself. You must be regenerated. Water in the Spirit, you must be 
regenerated by the Spirit. So you and I are the messengers. We take the seed of this gospel. We live this gospel out. We share the word of repentance and, and new life that you can have in Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We proclaim that message to those who had not heard, or those who think they have heard. And then like the farmer who goes to sleep, and the next day he gets up or, you know, he sees the sprouting of the grain. It germinates a little at a time until it gets to its full grain production. We don't produce that. We do the work. God uses us and empowers us and strengthens us to do the work, but he brings the growth. So I've heard people, and, and you pray for people, and I've heard people just really um, almost militant, militantly try to get people saved. Or I got this person saved all here. You didn't do anything. All you did was present the word. And that's the beauty of the gospel. God does the work. He regenerates the heart. Looking at the way the seed grows, the kingdom of God is compared to the, the sphere of salvation here. It, it advances through the proclamation of the gospel. And the farmer plants and he waits. You as the sower are not involved in the growth process. That is the Lord himself. The regeneration and spiritual transformation is the work of the Spirit of God. Ephesians 2. Through, though believers are involved in proclaiming the message, they take no credit when unbelievers respond in repentant faith. In fact, what we do is we rejoice in that. And that's the, the other part of this parable. When the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. The point is that we enjoy the fruits of that crop. The farmer has no power behind the regeneration of the seed, so the evangelist has no power behind the regeneration of souls. John Owen says this, John Owen, a 17th century Puritan said this, it is always to be remembered that the whole Trinity is involved in the work of regeneration. It originates in God's kindness and love as Father, from his will, purpose, and counsel. It is a work of love and grace. It was procured for sinners by Jesus Christ our Savior. But the actual washing of regeneration and the renewing of our souls is the work of the Holy Spirit. See, we have nothing to do with that. Titus 3, 4-6 says, When but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And then we are given the harvesting and taking the sickle is we are given the privilege of rejoicing in that harvest. And that's the blessing of fellowship with the body of Christ. The riches of that fellowship will last for all eternity. You know, unless we get to the point where we realize that we actually are enjoying in our fellowship the body of Christ's regenerative work, then perhaps we don't understand any of this to begin with. If you don't enjoy the fellowship of the body, and I know we all have different backgrounds, we have different propensities, some of us have shorter tempers than others. Some of us are more agreeable than others. We sin. We, you know, there's all that, that mess that goes on in people that are regenerated but not fully sanctified yet. I get all that. But that's why we have the body to help each other out. That's why we have the body to, to encourage each other, to encourage each other to spiritual growth. And if, that, we don't see, if we don't see that, then we're not regenerate. If we can't, if that's, if we don't understand any of that, if we can't understand that the body of Christ is important for the proclamation of the word, for the testimony of, of what Christ has done in us, and to encourage and to help each other grow, then, um, then we, I, I fear that we're not even regenerate. So, 
we have the privilege of rejoicing in the harvest that God has given to us. And you know what the other privilege we have too is that when somebody comes to know Christ, when somebody's heart has been regenerated and they have believed, they have a desire to learn, you have the privilege as an older believer to take them into the word and to disciple them and to walk with them through all the difficulties of life and the learning of the word to the application and implementation of the word, you have that privilege. That is an awesome privilege. And this is something that the riches of this fellowship is going to last for eternity. The thirdly and, and quickly is the parable of the mustard seed. What can compare to the kingdom of God? That the, what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown onto the ground is the smallest of all seeds in the earth. And the mustard seed was a very, very tiny. It wasn't, it's not the smallest seed on the earth, but at this time, this mustard seed was the very smallest seed known to them. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The kingdom of God is not of human design, thirdly. And that's the point of this parable. We didn't create it, design it, or anything. God creates spiritual life so we can walk confidently in our call to evangelize. And so he takes what is tiny, and this kingdom is going to be like this. The kingdom of Christ is going to be like this. Sometimes we fill in the minority. It's very tiny, but yet it's going to blossom and grow, and to the point where a mustard plant would grow to about 15 feet. I'm large enough, the bush would be large enough that birds could rest in it. And I think there's a, there's a point here to be said about them bringing in the, the whole idea of of the, the birds, the air can make their nest in the shade, the kingdom of God will encompass millions of people. It already has. The kingdom of God also, now remember he's talking to Jewish believers here. And I think he's giving a hint also at this time of the grafting in of the Gentiles into this kingdom, this idea of kingdom. Of course, kingdom goes all the way back to the Old Testament. But that idea that the entire world will be invited into this kingdom of proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, every person has the opportunity to hear the gospel, to respond to the gospel, to be brought into this kingdom. And though it may be small, it will grow and flourish to something very large. And so this is another um, teaching about the kingdom that Jesus wants his Believers, He wants you and I to understand. He wants you and I to know that this kingdom is a work that we need to be faithful in and that it is a work that he produces the results. So you are the laborers, he produces the results, and he shares, you share in that harvest in the fellowship with each believer. And the kingdom, though small, will grow to encompass whoever will come and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we move on, he ends with, we sh uh, with many such parables, he spoke the word to him as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So now he's, he's turning from his public ministry and now to his private ministry. And here he's going to get really into the disciples and teach them about this kingdom and what to expect. So this morning, I trust that if you haven't come into this kingdom, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you have not turned from your sin and confessed that he is Lord and Savior from that sin which keeps you from the holiness of God, I'd ask you to do that this morning. Come to the Savior. Trust in him. Believe in him. Repent of your sin. Exercise the faith that he gives you to believe in him as Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning, you know God, but you think you don't need to make him Lord or it's inconvenient for him to be Lord, then I have two questions for you. One, maybe you're not saved, so check your heart. Or two, you need to do that. You need to get your heart right. You need to, to bow before the King of Heaven and say, things haven't been right. And I need, to, I need to get them right with you, Lord. Give me the strength and the ability to do that. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for teaching us and reminding us that we need to be lights in this world, that we cannot passively sit by or hide what we believe, but we must proclaim with diligence and with clarity that which has gone happened in our lives. And so I pray, Father, for that. I pray that you do the work that is necessary here this morning in the hearts and the lives of all of us so that we might bring glory.